Hi, welcome to another Be Informed session. My name is Kyle Buhariwala and I'm the founder of Be Informed. Uh, I founded Be Informed to help people make good decisions through seminars which provide important information on topics of interest. Today, we'll be looking at business practices and building contracts, which is a very topical issue at this point in time, given recent uh, events in the construction industry and what uh, consumers of residential properties should look out for in their contracts and also in their engagements with their builder. Before we proceed, I'd just like to make a mention that this session is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel following the session. Uh, and also I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we're meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Today's session is based on Australian laws and principles. So please bear that in mind if you are watching this um, session from a country outside of Australia. But if you are within Australia, please make sure that you do um, check with any specific state and territory requirements because they do vary um, across the board. Uh, as a disclaimer, this session is providing information about legal principles, but it's not supposed to be taken as legal advice. Information is general only um, and does not consider your personal circumstances or needs. If you do have any specific queries about your circumstances or needs, please do contact a professional including a lawyer like Paul. Um, and in terms of the currency of the information today being presented, it's current as of this month. Uh, if you do wish to recall this session in the future or refer to it down the track, please ensure that you check the currency of the information as it might change. Um, in terms of other housekeeping matters following the session, um, I'll be sending out a one page handout which summarizes key aspects of today's two seminars. Uh, Paul has kindly prepared two one-page handouts and they'll be sent through to registered participants by email. Uh, there'll be time for Q&A at the end of today's um, seminar number two. So there's two seminars today. Seminar one will be on business practices and building contracts, uh, business practices, sorry. And then the second seminar will be on building contracts. And then following that we'll have Q&A, which um, will open up uh, if to ask questions uh, for them, for you, if you want to ask a question, please do send the question through the chat function and then I'll relay that is through to Paul for him to answer. So uh, I think without further delay, I think we can get straight into it, Paul. So I'll move to the next slide and um, you, you can go from now. All right. Thanks, Carl. Um, so this is an umbrella term, unfair and misleading conduct, so it, which consists of a few forms of conduct by businesses that are either unfair or um, unsafe for consumers um, or misleading in some way or um, defective um, products. So the first um, area we're going to explore is unfair contract terms. So that doesn't mean that um, if the consumers entered into a contract and then they have second thoughts and think, well, I think that seems a bit unfair. I might try to get out of it. It's not quite as simple as that, unfortunately. What this is about is it's got to be a standard form contract, first of all. So it's got to be a contract where the consumer has entered into a contract where they have, they have not had a chance to negotiate the terms. So it's a standard term or standard form that, I say, a business uses all the time. Um, I've got next to me a list of industries where standard form contracts are very common. Uh, telecommunications in finance, domestic building, so that's the HIA and Master Builders Association contracts, um, gymnasiums or fitness facilities, motor vehicle rentals, travel and utilities. So one of the exclusions, and I am jumping a little bit um, ahead, but one of the exclusions that I need to mention is if the consumer has actually negotiated um, so the term or the, some terms and there's a departure from what that business normally um, offers by way of contracts, then it, it will not be a standard term contract and cannot fall under the unfair contract terms regime. So what makes a contract unfair? Um, first of all, it's where it's not necessary. So when I say not, it's not necessary, that doesn't really help very much, but it's not necessary 
in a sense, it doesn't actually protect anybody, but it's there really for the for the business businesses convenience or benefit only. Um, the term being in the contract would um, leave an imbalance in the party's right, rights and obligations. So basically what that means is the term would be very heavily slanted towards a business and operate to benefit the business rather than the consumer, which leads on to the last um, bit which makes the contract unfair, which is the term operates to the detriment of a party or party and which is um, primarily a consumer operates to their detriment. And I think that um, it's really important when we're discussing where we are right now with to give some examples, because you might be thinking, well, show me some examples and what is an unfair term. So some of these I have actually encountered in practice. Um, in particular, the first one, which is a right to amend without the other party's consent. So contract 101 or ABC principles is that if you enter into a legally binding contract, if one of the parties wants to amend that contract, the other party has to agree and both parties have to consent. Um, both parties have to consent to enter into a contract and they have to consent and agree to vary it. So if there's a right to amend the contract in the business's favour, um, whether the consumer likes it or not, that could definitely lead to it being classed as an unfair term or an unfair contract. Um, price increases without consent. Um, and just by the way, by way of reminder, Carl did mention that we're going to be talking about building contracts a bit later. And often the issue with building contracts, a very topical issue at the moment, is where the, the builder is trying to impose a price increase without the um, without the owner's consent after signing the contract. Another one which I've seen quite often is where the business as a term that says that nobody or the consumer cannot sue anybody, um, that we don't guarantee anything under this contract. Um, and basically, if something goes wrong, um, the consumer is left without a remedy. So courts don't like that. If it ever got to a court, to the court, to the door of the court, courts will say, well, you're actually, what you're trying to do by um, putting a term like that in is saying, to the court, you don't have jurisdiction or power over this. Um, the consumer has agreed to waive all his rights. Um, and so he's going to be left without a remedy and the courts don't like that. They guard their jurisdiction quite jealously and will protect their right to pronounce and you know determine disputes. Um, a termination clause without cause is quite common. And that just really means that there is a right to terminate um, the contract without any reason. Um, now, sometimes both parties are given that right, which can operate to the advantage of the consumer because they might change their mind and wish to get out. But the unfair contract terms regime outlaws such terms where it only gives a right to terminate without cause to the business and doesn't give a corresponding right to the consumer. Um, Another exclusion from these laws, um, as I said before, is where the term is actually has had, sorry has actually been negotiated between the parties. And just on that point, it's rare to find a whole contract would be unfair, where we are talking about unfair contract terms for a reason. And that reason is that most of the time the problem or the issue is with a term or two or three, hopefully no more than that. And not with the whole contract as a, not with the whole contract in its entirety. Um, another exclusion um, is where there's a, sorry an exclusion clause is also an example of an unfair term, and that is where very common in the old parking situation where you drive up to a parking bay to and you put in a ticket that lifts up the boom gate, and there's a sign that says. Um, no liability or responsibility taken for any theft, damage um, uh, or destruction to any vehicles that park on these premises. It is all on the, the owner and is your sole responsibility. 
so they probably are a standard term contract. Um, they're given the same terms, not that anybody ever reads them, are given on every occasion. And of course, the, you cannot turn up as a driver to those booths and say, well, I'm not happy about clause A, B, C and D, um, so I wish them to be amended. That just doesn't happen. You drive up, you don't have any choice but to accept the terms. It's what's called on a take it or leave it basis. So an exclusion clause, which limits the party's liability under the contract, um, or which excludes liability completely, which is really just avoiding the law again, that's a different way of avoiding the law, um, is another example of an unfair contract term. So what are the consequences? Now, um, just while I, before I get to there, the, there has been some changes in this area, and that's why what Carl said at the um, inception of today's event is very critical. As of November 2023, um, a lot of the unfair contract terms regime is going to be strengthened. Um, there was a recognition by Parliament that a lot of the laws were not working and having their intended effect, and that businesses were getting around the laws too easily, and that they weren't really having the, a deterrent effect. Um, so there's going to be penalties now of $5 million. So previously there was not a penalty, so that was not one of the um, consequences or an order that the court could have made where there was a term that was unfair. Basically, before what would happen is that the court could just strike the term out of that contract and declare it void. So it's as if it doesn't exist. And so that clause would be of nil, no, no effect. That's power to declare the term void still exists. So does the um, avenue where the court could order compensation if somebody suffered financial loss and damage. The court can also make a declaration where they basically the court will make an order that they declare that the law has been breached. Um, and then the court has a power to order any other remedies that they believe appropriate. But as I said, now there is some strengthening of the laws um, to deter, and it's usually um, small, smaller businesses that are um, falling themselves foul of the unfair contract terms regime. Um, and I think that a lot of the time, the reason is not, it's not necessarily deliberate conduct, conduct but it's through a lack of knowledge. Um, we've obviously got a pretty complex legal system in Australia, and there are some, some small businesses who are falling foul of the unfair contract terms regime um, inadvertently um, with no ill intent. And by the way, it does not require um, any intention to, um, to impose an unfair term. If there's an unfair term, regardless of the intention, then the regime does apply. So there's significant penalties for businesses now, and there is a significant lead in time to the new laws, which start in November this year. Um, and I think that the changes were flagged to be um, put into place to come into effect 13 months after they were brought into, into being. So they were passed through Parliament about October 2022, and they take effect in November 2023. So they make um, the, 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 the penalties or the consequences for businesses um, who breach the unfair contract terms regime really significant now. Um, and hopefully they will have the deterrent effect that it was supposed to. Um, now we'll turn to defective products. So what actually is a defective product? Sometimes you might say, well, that's common sense. I, if this product doesn't work, it's defective. Or you know, the wires are hanging out of an electrical device, well, that's um, defective. The legal definition is what not what a reasonable consumer would expect, um, such as unsafe products. So we're going to talk about unsafe products a little bit later um, in the presentation today, but any product that's unsafe would obviously be defective. Um, a product that doesn't work at all, or doesn't work in the way that it should, or, or, or supposed to have, um, design flaws and faults, all, all those types of things can um, make a product defective. So it is, what a, not, it is not what a reasonable consumer would expect it to be. So that would not cover a situation where 
you have someone who's extremely finicky or picky about a particular product and they think that they're not very happy with about the way that it works, that would not necessarily be defective because it is they would not necessarily be classed as a reasonable consumer. So the remedies for a consumer who has bought a product that is defective, um, I think people are very keen to know that. There's a range of remedies. The ACCC can sometimes get involved. Um, the Consumer Affairs in Victoria has a subsidiary role, certainly can assist people in trying to perhaps negotiate some remedies or some sanctions um, for businesses. But so the, the range of remedies include a full or a partial refund of monies, um, compensation for loss and damage. So if somebody has suffered some income loss, um, or damage to some other equipment that has cost them money to have repaired or to fix up, get fixed up. Compensation is also available. A replacement item um, is another remedy that can be ordered by the court. This item didn't work um, business, so I'm going to make you supply a replacement item that does work. Um, court could order repair of the product so that it does work in the way that it's supposed to. And again, we have the catch-all provision where any other orders that the court would um, deem appropriate. And it is of note here that these remedies can be imposed against not only the retailer, so the big W or the Kmart or whoever, but also against the manufacturer, because often the, the issue is with the way that the products were manufactured and not, not at the point of sale. Um, and the retailers would have a defense in many of these cases where they did not know and, and could not know um, that the products were defective. So there's often publicity um, that goes out into the media about product recall notices. You know, these airbags were defective. Um, this vehicle um, is defective. So they can also be ordered by the court, um, adverse publicity orders. And even in extreme situations, the court can say, um, this person who is a director of a retailer or manufacturer who was involved in the contravention, and so they're classed as an accessory, they um, may also be banned from operating corporations. So I don't think that would happen if it happens once or twice, but it is a, a repeated pattern of behaviour. And a director of a business um, may be banned from managing corporations for the future. So some of the defences, so retailers and or manufacturers are not on the hook um, or liable, so to speak, automatically. So one of the defences in the Australian Consumer Law or the Competition and Consumer Act is where the defect is obvious. So in that sense, consumers do have a little bit of a duty to protect their own interests. If something is obviously defective, then you can't then complain about it. If the defect arises from a cause beyond human control, um, pretty much speaks to itself. But if the defect could not have been avoided by anything that the retailer or manufacturer did or didn't do, then the retailer or manufacturer would not be liable. And where the defect results from an abnormal use of the goods, um, pretty hard to prove on the from the retailer or manufacturer's point of view that the consumer did use it in an abnormal way they're not going to you know obviously be there and see how the consumer was using it but sometimes the use of a product and it's obvious from looking at it that it was used in a abnormal or different way um, now we can turn to misleading and deceptive conduct one of my favorite areas um, and which really covers businesses or individuals, but primarily businesses. Um, the section was put into place to protect consumers. Um, it dates back to probably 1974 when they passed laws called the Trade Practices Act, which is now what's called the Australian Consumer Law, the Competition and Consumer uh, Act. Um, misleading deceptive conduct can cover um, anything, any statement um, written or uh, verbal that is likely to mislead or deceive somebody else. So when I say likely, that is pointed to the fact that the conduct or the statement does not does not have to actually mislead or deceive. 
But if it doesn't miss fatal disease, then potentially the recipient has not suffered any loss. Intent not is not necessary, um, which is a good thing. Okay. It'll be very hard to prove that somebody did intend to mislead or deceive. Um, you can't actually get into somebody's mind and pull out their intention. But if there is intent to mislead or deceive, it would certainly make, and that is proved, it would make um, the consumer or the ACCC who normally sue in these matters job a lot easier in saying that there was a misleading or deceiving because the representor actually meant to mislead or deceive. And they can actually be subject to fines if they did intend to mislead or deceive because it's a quasi um, or a criminal offence in a sense, although people won't be locked up in jail, but they will receive what are called pecuniary penalties. Um, and it, a very important point is that silence, so in other words, saying nothing can um, constitute misleading deceptive conduct, um, and which you might say, well, how can somebody be or fall foul of the law when they didn't even say anything? Um, and sometimes there is a duty to speak. So in a case, for example, where um, there's a, a sale of a house, Let's say we've got a developer who is selling houses um, and he knows that the area is a potential for the government to compulsorily apply the land at some point, um, such as what happened in the, the classic movie, The Castle. Um, the developer does not tell the consumers buying the land that there is a potential compulsory acquisition. The consumers buy the land and then Lo and behold, one year later, they have to sell up and move. That could be misleading deceptive conduct by silence. Um, as I said, that this law does apply and protect consumers, but the way that it is developed over time is that most of the time, in reality, the law is protecting businesses who are dealing with other businesses, um, particularly in relation to comparative advertising. You know, our products work better than yours. Um, whereas if they don't, that's potentially um, misleading deceptive conduct. Um, swinging back very quickly then to consumers though, they can be misled or deceived by false advertising, um, such as, you know, this product has certain features or benefits that it doesn't actually have. There is an exception to misleading deceptive conduct called, uh, a light, not a point term called puffery, where if you say, buy my coffee, my coffee tastes the best in the world, or uh, buy our cars because they they look, you know, they're the most attractive car in the market. Those, you can't really sue on or say they're misleading deceptive conduct because they're really just classed as sales talk or, you know, gibberish that sales pe people um, speak. So it's called puffery, so you can't really sue for that. It's just um, sales talk. Um, an example of misleading deceptive conduct. Another example um, from university days, I still remember this case where, again, these people, it was a misleading deceptive conduct by silence um, by, against a real estate agent. People were looking at buying the house. The real estate agent that they knew that there was a potential road widening proposal where a highway that was fairly adjacent to the property was going to be widened. The real estate deliberately concealed that fact and didn't disclose it because that would be definitely a material fact that the consumers had a right to know. Did not disclose that, the people bought in and then they, I would say, I don't know, but I would say that they again were subject to a compulsory acquisition situation where the government said, we are now going to buy part of your property to, to run this highway through and the um, consumers lost their, their homes. So that's another example in practice, but there's many, many cases, uh, many examples, as I say, primarily in business, um, particularly, as I say, comparative advertising that Westpac might say the ANZ um, term deposits um, don't actually give the interest rate that's been advertised where that is false. That's another example. And then we can move along to unsafe products. So there are a set of mandatory standards. Now, obviously, 
this area is guarded very closely by the ACCC. They monitor and enforce very strictly safety standards. As I said before, the um, faulty vehicles and faulty airbags and subject to public recall notices where you'll get um, advertisements in newspapers saying, you know, this, um, these products and particularly also children's clothing used to be quite a run of cases where there was pajamas or kids pajamas that were flammable. Um, as soon as they were subject to heat, they caught into flame. That would definitely be an unsafe product um, and would breach the mandatory standards. And there's definitely a strong consumer protection element um, there, particularly also where products like toys, uh, Christmas time, I think nearly every Christmas time you hear about some retailer or manufacturer who's fallen foul of, foul of the law where some people bought some products um, and they were unsafe and or, and or they didn't work in the way they were supposed to. So what can happen, and this does affect consumers, but also affects the retailers and all the manufacturers if they do put out unsafe products. Um, as I said, um, compulsory or even voluntary recall. So a business can put their hand up and say, look, we've, um, we've distributed this product and it, it is unsafe and we are putting out, uh, which you see often um, with um, food, food products where there you know, might be bits of plastic and something or stuff like that. So voluntary and compulsory recalls, there can be bans so that the product is not to be sold anymore. An injunction, which is basically a court order that says, to get the products off the market or to stop selling them and or to stop advertising them. Consumers who have been, um, who have suffered loss or damage by use of those um, unsafe products can be compensated for their losses. Um, again, like we said before, replacement items, partial or full refunds, repair, um, and safety bans. Uh, as I said before, interim and permanent ban and or, sorry, interim and or permanent bans on goods. So there might be an interim ban until the particular issue has been resolved with the product, or there might be a permanent ban, as in you can never sell that product ever again. Um, again, there can be fines on the businesses, which are really significant in the millions. However, as per the usual, when matters reach court, if it ever got to that stage, it would be the Federal Court of Australia uh, would be involved in these types of things. The, the remedies that um, can be awarded by a court in these circumstances are really at large or in the tribunal or the court's discretion. So they can basically order um, whatever remedy they see fit to order. And now on to the ACCC, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. So the ACCC is basically split into two parts. One part which we will not be dealing with today is to do with competition between businesses. This is a, this, and then there's the other part which we're discussing today is the consumer protection um, part. So the ACCC has a number of aspects of their role in the marketplace in Australia. So they do have a dob in line or also a way that you can report unsafe behavior unfair conduct by businesses, defect, defective products and the like. So basically whistleblower, you can make reports of these practices to, um, by businesses to the ACCC. Um, the next part is they can investigate, then investigate the alleged breaches of the law. They are an education body in that they put out a multitude of publications and material that educates consumers um, as to their rights, they do enforce law. So they do take some matters to court. They generally only won't do so, sorry, they generally only will do so where a large number of consumers have been affected, um, such as seven or more. So where, why I say seven or more, seven is the, um, the lower threshold where a class action might be instituted. <clears throat> so seven or more plaintiffs have been injured or suffered loss and or where there's some vulnerable consumers, um, kids' toys and the like, what I said before, pyjamas and the like have been flammable. Um, they may institute class actions against the retailer and or the manufacturer. Um, 
you know, they are a government body, so their resources are in that sense somewhat limited. And so they will not um, necessarily always institute those court actions, but they often will enter into correspondence with their businesses as well. And their businesses might be invited to enter into undertakings. Um, we will be good boys and we won't um, issue those unsafe or defective products anymore. And because if we do, we agree to pay a penalty. Another part of the ACCC's role is undertaking studies as to what exactly is going on in the market um, so that they can better um, service the public. They also monitor enforcement. They do um, surprise audits or random audits as to compliances with the laws that they administer. Um, they educate the community and they also hold training sessions, which are generally free um, as to consumer rights in the Australian marketplace. So they have a very broad role. Website is www.accc.gov, that's G-O-V for Victor, dot A-U. So they are really at the apex, I think, of the consumer um, protection marketplace in Australia. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. That was great. Um, so Paul's details are on the screen. Um, if you have any specific questions about the information that he's provided you today, please feel free to reach out to him. Uh, just as a reminder, this seminar does cover general information only about legal principles. So if you do have any specific concerns about your circumstances, it's best to seek help from a professional. Um, in terms of Q and A, remember after the following seminar, we will have um, a session on Q and A. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them through the chat function, and I will then relay them through to Paul. And also, as a reminder, following today's session, there will be the two one-page handouts distributed by email to those that have registered. They will cover both the the current session, which was on um, business practices, and also the next session, which will be on which is on uh, building contracts. So we'll move right to the next one um, on residential building contracts. It's definitely a, an important topic um, of recent, given issues in the construction industry and how to navigate um, business, uh, you know, builders trying to sort of, I think, um, exercise their rights in ways that might be a bit different to what consumers might expect. So um, Paul has all the details, so let's hear more about it. Thanks, Carl. <clears throat> So I think uh, yeah, we're ready to go on to the first one, which is a very topical issue at the moment. Price increases after they sign the contract. So in other words, throughout the build, um, perhaps early on in the build, the builder then communicates with the owners and says, well, um, materials, have, materials have increased. Um, we can't get labor. Um, the economy and the, the building industry in general is really suffering financially, which is flowing through to us. And so therefore we need to increase the contract price. Um, so builders are doing that in situations where there, there is sometimes a fixed contract, sorry, fixed price contract. And they're also doing that where there is not a fixed price contract, but is subject to variations. And the main example of that one is a cost plus contract. So a cost plus contract is one which um, I generally discourage um, people from entering into because it does give price uncertainty. There is fairly large scope for um, cost plus contracts to result in price increases for the consumers. Um, however, I guess in a sense, um, the consumer is aware that the price may vary because the whole nature of a cost plus contract which presumably would have been explained to you by the builder, the whole nature of it is that it is um, a form of contract where the price may increase because sometimes it's not not possible at a given point in time to precisely um, give a figure for materials that could change down the line. Um, so prime cost and provisional sum items, that was a good segue into those two items. They are also to do with items where, for example, the, the, the consumer has not chosen 
some of the appliances or some of the, the products or the, the building material products that are go, going to go in. So therefore, price can't be estimated. So the price may vary. As a uh, uh, so prime cost and provision or some items are both um, avenues where the price could increase. So provision or some items are, well, we we're, we're only able to give an estimate um, in relation to certain materials at this point in time. So therefore, um, the price in the end could vary, invariably increase and not decrease, by the way. So that's another way, although pretty uncommon, um, but probably more common on larger builds and more specialised builds rather than the standard, I think it's called turnkey um, contracts where everything's pretty standard and there's a standard form contract without any special conditions. Uh, variations, now that's far more common, but the main thing to pe for people to remember about variations is they are ways that the contract price can be increased by agreement. So in that case, the consumer does actually agree to vary the price, um, which feeds into agreement between the homeowner and the builder, but variations are a set or a specific type of um, change provided for in all the fixed term, con sorry, in all the standard term contracts, a variation can be requested and or sought by both the owner and the builder. So the builder might um, be starting to do some work and for example, find some rock, rock in the soil when they're excavating that they did not know about and could not have known about. And so therefore they then request a variation to the contract to the contract price, potentially to the contract um, term, in other words, how many the, the build days and the amount of build days. Um, the key thing about variations is that the other party can dispute it. So a, a builder can request a variation, which the owner can dispute or reject um, or accept. The owner can, ex can request a variation, again, which the builder can accept or reject. It's far more common um, for a variation to be initiated by a builder. It is a little bit of a fertile ground for disputes. Um, it is also a fertile ground for consumers potentially being misled. And that's not to say that builders are doing this deliberately or that, the, that um, this is a particular problem. I'm only talking by experience by saying that what often happens is the builder is in the course of the build and realize, for example, uh, I'll give an example, which um, I remember from practice, all these down lights that you want throughout the house, the particular brand that you wanted, which is in the plans and specifications is now not available anymore. Um, I quoted 10 grand on all those down lights um, previously. The only brand that's roughly equivalent in the look and feel and the way that they operate is 18 grand. Um, and so the builder is then meant to um, request in writing from the owner, give the detail, what the extra price is about, how the variation has come about, and if um, that variation is going to result in the build time being increased or blown out, then that information is also, also to be given. In my experience, particularly operating from the dispute resolution sphere in the past in building um, building construction law, is that what happens is the builder realises they want to do a variation, sends the invoice through to the consumer. The consumer says, oh, well, here's an invoice from the builder. I'm used to paying money to the builder. We had to pay the deposit. I'm making progress payments. This is another invoice. I'll just pay it and no questions are asked. And maybe the parties go along like that and everything's fine and no issue, but it was actually not the correct process. Every standard form building contract in the residential sphere has a set process where the request is given in writing and within seven days, generally, the owner um, is free to accept or reject the variation. Um, then I guess the question arises, well, if the owner does not accept the variation, then the parties have to negotiate. They have to discuss it, try to work, try to work out a resolution. Unfortunately, my experience in the past is that, as I said, variations are a little bit of a fertile ground for disputes to arise. 
and sometimes in the minority of cases it's the variations that then lead to a dispute which encompasses other items so it stems from variations and then um, comes further uh, sorry extends further than that and and goes goes even further so agreement between the homeowner and the builder to amend the price is possible as I said, um, which generally refers to variations, but every now and then there might be a special condition added in after signing and or one of the standard contract terms is varied or deleted or amended by a, the addition of a special condition. Um, all these types of price increases, the key thing is communication. Um, if the consumer knows that the uh, potential for the price increase is there and the builder is upfront and honest, then generally there's not going to be an issue. There is also, even in fixed term contracts, which actually creates a lot of angst amongst owners, in the standard MBA and HIA building contracts, it might even say in the contract somewhere, this is a fixed price contract. And then there's nearly, there's nearly always a box which is shaded um, in dark gray, so it stands out. And it actually says up the bottom, up, sorry, up the top, warning, um, this is not a fixed term contract. The price may vary because of. And there's usually about six, seven or eight clauses where further circumstances can arise where the building contract can um, change. Um, but what I always say is that when you look into those particular clauses, they're very unusual events. There's things like the building price increases as a result of a direction by a building surveyor. The building price increases because of a change in the law. Um, the building price increases because um, excavation and foundational data was, was incorrect in the past and now there's going to be extra costs. So they're all very unusual items. Um, all I'm saying is that they are another way that building contracts can vary in price, but um, those particular variations are very uncommon. So you'll certainly see them they're in, um, in building contracts. They take up nearly half of a page of a standard form contract. And as I said, it come, comes with a warning at the top um, that says warning that this price, this contract is not a fixed price contract and, it, and, the, and the price may vary because of um, then we move to variations again. So as I said before, they're not just um, amendments to the contract price, but they are an amendment to the plans and specifications. They are an amendment potentially to the, the build time. So build time is usually me measured in a certain amount of days. For example, from commencement to completion, 300 days. Variations can actually result in the build time be extended being extended. The build time can be extended pursuant to a separate regime on its own, and that is called extension of time claims. But here we're talking about variations, um, say in materials or in the method that are to be that is to be used that results in a change in the contract price. Um, they're valid when they're in writing, and they're valid when the consumer has had a chance to accept or reject them. Now, if the Builder went ahead and did the variation, say installed the new new down lights, or um, did did some other feature without the owner's consent and without the variation procedure being complied with. Um, the builder then says, "Well, we did this extra thing. Yes, we didn't ask you for your consent, but it is now going to improve the value of your home. In fact, it makes your home look better." The owner has a look at it and says, "Yeah, it makes the owner it does make the home look better, but I didn't agree to it." I didn't consent to it. You didn't tell me you were going to do it. You've just done it. So then the question becomes, um, because they haven't followed the correct process in the contract, um, is the owner liable in that case where they haven't consented to the change? The answer is yes, they are. And that might surprise you, but the owner has, well, even though they haven't had a choice, they have accepted the benefit of it. It is, has improved the value of the house but they will not have to pay, generally speaking, the price that the, that the builder has put on that variation. Um, 
if it came to VCAT or a dispute resolution body like the DBDRV, which we'll talk about a bit later, then the the owner may need to pay a, a reasonable value. So you'd have to get quotes on that from the market, come up with a reasonable value, which invariably will be a lot less than the um, than the cost of the variation, which was imposed on the owner without their consent by the builder. As I said, document the variation, include the detail and timing. It's all in the detail. Um, and in fact, it can be a, a breach of the Domestic Building Contract Act if you if the builder was not to document the variation correctly, um, as it says there. The, um, as I say, the homeowner can dispute the variation. Um, they should do so in writing. They should do so as soon as possible, within seven days um, after the uh, variation is received. Now, seven days is going to tick by pretty quickly, particularly where the owner says, "Well, I need to get, I need to go and see a lawyer. I can't get into the lawyers I want to see. They're not available for another week, um, for example. So, I'm going to be responding somewhere between seven to fourteen days. Um, really, what the owner will have to do is just have to negotiate with the builder." And we are going to talk about dispute resolution soon, but I can't stress more highly, um, particularly um, with the delays in VCAT, um, the importance of negotiating. And in fact, I think even the standard contracts um, mention that too. Um, they do talk a little bit about dispute resolution and they really encourage people to negotiate. Obviously, negotiation um, can be exhausted, but we'll get to that soon. So the variation is disputed by the homeowner. The builder says, I don't agree with your with you disputing it. We are now in dispute. What are we going to do? Um, and that now leads as a segue into disputes between the owner and a builder and how to resolve them. As I've said, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Um, put everything in writing if you can, even if you have a conversation. Um, where you've had a negotiation with the other party, go home as soon, or as soon as possible, write down what was said, who said it, what day it was, where you were, and the time. So you've got a contemporaneous record of what was discussed. And as I said, be strategic about it, um, which just means protect your interests, but always with the goal in mind, um, which consumers often have, and that is that if we get into dispute now, then the build um, is potentially going to stop, stop altogether. Um, there are reasons why the builder can suspend the works. Um, if you get into that territory where the owner has done something that may give a rise, give rise to a right to suspend the works, um, then the work's going to stop. Um, and then once the works stop, you then have to stop time running to calculate how many days for the build. Um, if you stop the works in the middle of winter in Melbourne, then you, you know, may be further weather delays as well. So that would not be a good thing. So really try to exhaust the avenue of negotiation as far as possible. Consumer Affairs Victoria, they have a good website as well. I think it's www.cavtovictor.vic.gov.au. And they have some information about just generally um, building contracts and disputes. Um, they also do a phone line, I believe, um, where people can ring them up for advice as to how to resolve issues. Um, but they don't necessarily have much of a further role in actually getting into the nitty gritty and helping parties resolve the matter. Um, they're more of a education or an advisory body. And then we have the DBDRV, the Domestic Building Dispute Resolution of Victoria. It's a body set up by the Victorian government probably about six years ago now, might even be a bit more than that. And it was set up as a gateway um, where builders can actually go to it, as well as consumers or homeowners, who, and it's free. Um, you don't need lawyers. In fact, they actively discourage lawyers from being involved in the process. Although the nature of the issues often means that the lawyers will be involved to some extent. Um, they, they were, sorry, I didn't, uh, they, the body was set up as a gateway so that parties were not going straight to VCAT if they had a domestic building dispute. 
it was clogging up VCAT's list and leading to um, long delays in VCAT. And so this body was set up. Whether it's achieved its objective, I think it probably it has. Um, it probably has varied um, in achieving its objective. It probably did through COVID, but now that building disputes are, or the sorry, building of projects um, are all underway now post COVID. I think that the DBDRB um, is not really having um, an effect on the delays in VCAT at the moment, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. The Victorian Civil Administrative Tribunal, their delays now are quite horrendous. Um, there has been a lot of senior members of the tribunal who retired. Not all of them were replaced. Um, realistically, now, if a, a homeowner or a builder was to issue an application in VCAT, you would be looking at three to four years before you got to a hearing. Most cases don't go to a hearing. Most cases settle earlier um, by mediation. So VCAT um, is a last resort. And I really mean that as a last resort, try to avoid it at all possible. Um, in the one page handout that Carl mentioned, that's going to be handed out today. Um, I do say only as a last resort, delays are long and plan ahead. Now, there is also a possibility that if you have a domestic building dispute that you don't need to go through VCAT and you can take it straight to a court. Um, however, I won't um, bore people or um, overly complicate things by saying that if a homeowner was to issue a domestic building dispute in the Magistrates Court in Victoria, for example, the Magistrates Court um, there is provision for the matter to be kicked back to VCAT. So you're really potentially going to be wasting time and money by issuing a potential by uh, issuing a a domestic building dispute in a, in the magistrate's court because you may be kicked over to VCAT anyway, although not necessarily. Um, thanks, Carl. Let's move on to builders' contractual obligations. What is the builder meant to do? It sounds very obvious, but work to the plans and specifications. I do a lot of building contract reviews um, before people assign, sorry, people, before people sign the contract. And I say, please go through every item in the specifications. And this is not meaning to say that builders are at fault, but sometimes it's just a typo in the office. An item has been missed, an error has been made, um, some other, some other, Specification was put in by error. So um, I always encourage homeowners before they sign the contract to check the plans and specifications, not so much the plans, because um, obviously I'm not a builder and if I had a look at a set of plans now, I, I wouldn't be able to interpret them. But the specifications, which often you know list in bullet point form or uh, one, two, three, four, exactly uh, what the homeowner has requested the build to be. Um, check them, and that's what the builder is meant to work to do to a T. Deliver what has been agreed to be delivered, which really relates to deliver the house um, in the way that the contract said it was to be delivered. If that's what you're contractually obliged and required to deliver, then that's what um, has to be delivered um, with no variation unless the, the, the variations have been agreed. Comply with the contract price. Um, common, uh, sorry, um, common sense. But and we talked before about variations to the contract price in certain limited circumstances. If a builder is trying to impose a, a contract price um, on an owner, and in my experience anyway, they are becoming a little bit more clever. Yeah, about trying to impose price increases, and some of them may well be valid if push come to shove, or if it was was taken to VCAT. All I'm saying is that sometimes builders are trying to um, get contract prices changed by clever schemes that the the owners really need to get some advice. Um, deliver in the required time frame. So we talked a little bit before about build time. So the standard HIA and MBV or Master Builders Victoria contracts will have a box somewhere in the contract that sets out the amount of days 
that the build time is required. So it'll be, say, I saw one the other day, 369 days. One last week was 300 days. So we promised to build this house um, in the required time frame. And in that period of time, delays are, and when I say delays, I'll explain that in a second, delays are factored in. So weekends and public holidays are factored in. Inclement weather is also factored in. And sometimes there are small allowances for other um, things which may hold the build up, but usually only you know for, for a few days at a time. So um, that's why it's very important for an owner to find out or to be advised, which a builder should advise, when the work starts. Because if you don't know when the work starts, then you don't know they're, they're late. And the delivery in the required time frame is important because, again, most standard building contracts have what's called a liquidated damages clause, um, which is a clause that says that if the builder is late, that they agree to pay the standard fee, sorry, the standard cost is $250 per week by way of liquidated damages. When I say liquidated, what that means is that it is a set fee or set price. The industry standard is the builder, if they're late, will pay $250 per week by way of compensation to the owner, which amount is usually taken out um, out of the final payment when it's made at completion. And so the delivery in the required time frame has a penalty. On the converse, um, the, the builder, although it's rare that these are claimed, the builder also has a right to claim liquidated damages from the build. If the build is late, because the owner has done or not done something um, that held up the build. Um, that's quite unusual. So delivery in the required time frame is required by the law and required by the contract. Again, we're talking about communication with the owner. Um, can't stress that enough. Be open, honest and transparent. Try to document everything in writing. The biggest issue in domestic building disputes, um, and I'm saying this to try to prevent them is that there is disputes about what was said um, on site about a variation, for example, or ex an extension of time. Um, the builder is allowed to request to extend time um, for a good reason. They have to put it in writing. They have to say what the reason for the extension of time request is. They have to say why they are extending time. Um, as well, and it has to be in writing, they have to issue that to the owner, and the owner has a right to respond to that in writing as to whether they accept or reject the extension of time. And on that point, it is absolutely critical that the owner does respond to that notice, because if they don't respond, then it's deemed that they um, accept the extension of time request. Um, deliver a non-defective home, what happens? Probably 90% of my work previously at a domestic building dispute resolution firm was dealing with de defective or allegedly defective homes. Um, as I say in the one page handout, it is rare for a new home to not have minor issues. No, no new home can be perfect as long as they're cosmetic and or minor, they can and should and should and generally will be fixed. Um, Deliver a non-defective home, what happens? If it's got defects, then the owner should get an independent building inspector to do a report. I could walk into a home and I may or may not see a defect. I may or may not notice it. I don't have specialised building knowledge. So it may not be, and it may not be obvious to the naked eye, or it could be a structural defect that nobody is going to see, such as a slab defect or something to do with the foundations. So if there are defects that the owner is not happy about, get an independent building inspector. And when I say independent, they have a duty to be independent. So they're not going to write down into, into their report what the owner wants them to say. Um, they swear up to an, an obligation of independence um, and they will then write a report, which will put in writing, which can be sent to the builder to say, this building inspector said, this place is defective in these respects. The builder can then, if they wish to, then go and get their own independent report 
hoping it doesn't get to that stage because then you're going to have a clash of the experts and that's where the parties may end up in VCAT or in the DVDRV where hopefully most uh, matters are resolved. So um, in most, sorry, in the standard domestic building contracts, there is what's called a defects liability period. Um, it's usually 60 days, although I saw one yesterday that was 365 days. And what that is, is it's a period of time after when the, the, the owners move in um, where the builder has to come back and fix any defects at the builder's cost. So that's for the period of time after the parties move in. If the owners notice any defects, notify the builder in writing. He's meant to come out and fix it. If they don't fix it, then it's a potential breach of the contract. In addition, in Victoria, after the issue of the, of the occupancy permit, and we'll get to that in a second when we're talking about completion stage, after the issue of the occupancy permit, the builder is legally liable for defects for 10 years thereafter. So there's a lot of protections there around defective homes or defects for consumers. Um, there are contractual warranties as to the quality of the work. There are legal um, legislative warranties as to the quality of the work. There's a defects liability period for a certain period of time. And then you've got 10 year limitation period, um, or what I call a long stop provision which means that 10 years after the occupancy permit, any issues arise as per defective works, which are not noticed at the time, but come into, come into being later or manifest themselves later, um, the, the owner can make a claim against the builder for those defects. And now we move along to completion stage. Hopefully it'll get to that. Um, and when is a home complete? So as I said before, no, no home will be perfect. A home is complete when it is reached practical completion. The definition of practical completion means that the works are complete except for minor omissions and defects which do not prevent the house from being lived in. Um, so a home is complete when that occurs. Um, a home being complete is usually coincides with the time when the occupancy permit is issued. Just on the occupancy permit, um, it is one of the documents that should be issued to the owners when they move in. Um, we'll get to that in a second. But the occupancy permits um, quite commonly confused for the owners often think that that is, that is a document that signifies that there are no defects in the house. That is not actually the case. Um, the occupancy permit only means that the house is safe to live in. It does not mean that it's defect free. What documentation is a homeowner required to receive on completion? As I said, the occupancy permit, sometimes a certificate of final inspection, a copy of the building permit, a copy of any planning permits if applicable, a copy of any insurance policies, although they should have been given at the start of the build and not at the end. Um, and the building, sorry, the insurance policy I'm talking about is a builder's warranty insurance policy. That should be also be given and any um, handbooks or documents that um, outline how uh, appliances should be used, how the garage door works um, and the like and things like that. They are the documentation that the homeowner is required to receive on completion, along with a copy of the signed contract. Um, the final payment claim. Um, a little bit of a, again, a bit of a fertile area of dispute. What happens is you get to the end of the build, the builder says, this home is now complete. Here's my final payment claim. The, build, the owners say, I want to inspect it. The owners come out and say, the place is defective. I'm not going to pay the final payment claim until you fix it. And then the builder says, well, I'm not going to fix it until you pay the final payment claim. So then you have a stalemate, um, quite common stalemate in domestic building disputes. Most of the time, that stalemate can be um, broken by following the process in the contract. Um, there is a standard set of clauses is about eight in a row and they basically work in order. Um, and if you follow the process to the letter, generally that stalemate doesn't happen. So first of all, the builder says in writing, this home is complete. You can come and inspect it. Here's the 
final payment claim. Um, here's the certificate of final inspection that they have done. The owner goes out there with their inspector, inspects the site, say there are defects. At that point, the owner doesn't have to pay the final payment claim as per the contract. But, but the trigger for the final payment claim being payable has not arisen yet. What then happens is there are defects. The building inspector says these are the defects, gives it to the builder. The builder and the owner sign a document signifying that they both agree that these are the defects. Um, and the, the builder signing that is not an admission by the builder that, that he believes that there are defects. It is just a step in the process. Then the builder says, I'm going to fix these defects. And he get, gets given 14 days to fix them. He fixes them, gives a written notice to the owner. The owner says, I'm now satisfied that the defects have been fixed. Now I'll make the final payment claim. The owner makes the final payment claim. The builder is satisfied. The builder says, here is the occupancy permit. Here are the keys. The, the property is yours now. And that's it. That's the end of the project. Um, and as I said, though, there is still the defects liability period to protect the consumer or the homeowner. And there's also the 10, 10 year limitation period. So can the homeowner get, get the house inspected at completion stage? The homeowner can get the house inspected at any stage, including completion on, on request. Um, if the homeowner requested the builder to, um, to have an inspector come and fix it, sorry, inspect the property and the, the builder was to refuse, it would be a breach of the contract. So can the homeowner get the house inspected at completion stage? Yes, they are, and it's standard and it's expected, and 99.99% of builders will allow that to happen. And what if there are defects at that stage? has already been discussed. I think that's um that's that one done. Completion stage. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Paul. That was a very insightful seminar. A lot of information there. So hopefully those watching today have taken away a lot um, from that seminar. Again, Paul's details are on screen. The information that Paul has shared is general information only. So if you do have any specific questions or what legal advice, feel free to reach out to Paul directly. We'll now move on to Q and A. Um, so we've got a few questions that we've received um, ahead of the schedule, uh, ahead of the session, and we've got questions that we've got actually through the chat function. So Paul, we'll start off with the um, and some of the questions I've actually actually answered so i'm going to not re-ask them again to you but um well that's handy that's good that's good yeah you've definitely covered up on a lot uh the first question that we've got is around building supervisors um sometimes they're engaged by the builder and sometimes you can sort of get them engaged directly by yourself oh building surveyor Bu you mean building surveyor not building supervisor no i'm just talking about building supervisors so you know how you've got a supervisor on site that's sort of having a look at um you know just sort of managing and checking the build uh yeah yeah it's sort of what what are your thoughts on their role because this person has asked that they've had a building supervisor and it's not been sort of keeping up to scratch um with with how the build's going um what yeah. sort of recourse do they have against the building supervisor or is that sort of uh something they have to take up with the builder yeah well the way that you've framed the question it suggests to me that the building supervisor is a representative of the builder yeah so um, if the builder is not dealing with the issues, then we've got all those issues, you know, all those avenues for um, dispute resolution we talked about. Yeah. So the building yeah. supervisor would generally be a builder, so they would not be independent. Um, right. Which means that, of course, a building supervisor, if um, if if met with a statement from the from an owner to say there are defects, the building su supervisor may well not not agree because they're not independent. Yeah, yeah. So maybe just for this person's benefit, then in the way they frame the question, is a building supervisor different to like a building inspector? Is that are they two different people? Yeah. Well, uh, to confuse things even more, hopefully not though. Yeah. A building supervisor and a building surveyor and a building inspector are all three different people altogether. Yeah. Right. So a building supervisor would, excuse me, probably generally be the uh, representative of the builder. A building inspector will be a completely and utterly independent company that. Um, specialise in doing building inspections. 
they will not be affiliated or have any connection or relationship with the builder. And a building surveyor is either a private or a council appointed building surveyor who basically signs off the work as it as it's meant to go and has various functions under the Building Act. So there are three different things. Yeah. All right, so that's probably helpful for that person to know that they're sort of different individuals. Yeah. Um, and they play different roles and they have different um, affiliations, I guess. Yeah, very yeah. different roles, very different. Yeah, yeah. The next one that we've got is around the defects liability period, which you mentioned. Um, question that right question has come through around that topic. And what I think based on their the way they frame the question, it seems like they're not getting much sort of cooperation from the builder during that period of time. What do you recommend they should do? It might be a few years after that uh, period started. What do you recommend they should do? Um, and what happens, for example, if the building company no longer exists in the future during that DFA liability period? You have a comment? Oh, well, that, that's another issue altogether. Yeah. With the company. Uh, so did you say years after the build after the defects liability period has expired? No, no, no. So years into it. So like they might have had to build a few years back. They're probably three, four years into the defects liability oh, yeah. period. Um, what can they do if the builder's not cooperating? Well, and then I'll just add on another question from my end, which is what 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 would happen if the builder no longer exists? Yeah, so, well, I hope I answered the question, but the defects liability period will not be a few years. It'll be sixty days is standard, sometimes ninety days. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've seen one 30 days, mate. Something in the back of my mind says I've seen one that's for 30 days, but 60 days. Uh, 365 days was a, the longest three, the longest defects liability period I've ever encountered, and that was a build that was a build that was worth over a million dollars. Right. But anyway, if we're talking three or four years down the track, and the builder, it might be a, might be a warranty question, Paul. It might be about the warranty. Um... Uh, well, yeah, I can answer the question about if the builder dis dies, disappears, or goes insolvent. Yeah. Years down the track, um, that's squarely covered by the builder's warranty insurance, and that's why, at the start of a build, it's so important that. And look, I've never heard of a builder not. So the, the builder is meant to arrange the builder's warranty insurance. In Victoria, it goes through um, QBE. That's that's the nominated insurer. Mm -hmm. um, the builder is not allowed to start work or receive any money unless they give the owner a correct, and when I say correct, with the name spelled correctly, um, complying uh, builder's warranty insurance policy, which covers defects and on completion, but only in four circumstances. Three of them are what we just mentioned. That builder's warranty insurance policy only covers owners in cases where the builder dies, disappears, or goes insolvent. So if they do die, disappear, or, or become insolvent, you, then the, the owners can claim through the builder's warranty insurance. Yeah, all right, that's important to know. Yeah, but the builder's warranty insurance is an imperfect beast, so to speak, because it only uh, has a cap on it, and it only covers defects and non-complete works. I think the cap is about 300K last time I looked. Oh, so is, you've got to approach it bigger than that. Is that an aggregate or a per item, per issue type? Oh, aggregate. Aggregate, yeah. All right. Yeah. So it won't necessarily um, give complete coverage, but uh, you would hope that we're not looking at a house with more than 300 k's worth of de uh, defects. Yeah, and that would cover the full warranty period, Paul, is that right? That would last until the yeah, end of the So world. when you say warranty period, just to be clear, um, the warranty period is, well, the contractual warranty period is basically 10 years. Yeah. In Victoria, I don't know about other states, but you can sue the builder for defective work for 10 years after the occupancy permit has been issued. And what you're suing for is a breach of the warranty. The warranties in section eight of the Domestic Building Contracts Act are that the, the, that the works will be done with due care and skill, using proper materials, complying with the law and the regulations, um, and those types of things. Yeah. They're the contractual warranties. So when you say warranty, that's probably what people are talking about. Yeah, yeah of course, the problem is using the word loosely. Um, yeah. But yeah, very important to raise that the, you know, this is in Victoria only and other states and territories may have different um, sort of warranty regimes. Yeah, there's a decision of the Supreme Court of Victoria. There's been a couple that have only been peculiar to Victoria, mm -hmm. where the limitation period where owners can sue builders was varied. And 
well, 10 years is a good period because it used to be six years. That's right, yeah. Causes an inconsistency for those later years. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, the next question that we've got, which is uh, from, from that's come through before the session, is around sort of misleading and deceptive conduct. Um, it looks like, and it's related to, it's good that we paired the two together, Paul, because it looks like it's in relation to um, the, uh, the building um, contract. Yeah. Uh, what I could take away from this question is that this person wants to know more about what happens if, um, you know, the builder is in control of the specification. Um, of course, I think what, what's happened here, the homeowner, you know, hasn't sort of visualized how it might look. They're sort of a bit uncertain about certain things. They might not have raised it, but when it's all done, it doesn't look the way they thought it would look. Um, like, you know, you know, the facade hasn't been rendered properly or something like that. I think that's the examples they gave. Uh, Paul, what what do you think? What channels does that person have from a misleading and deceptive conduct? Yeah. When the specification says one thing, but it looks different when it's when it's all built. So, two comments about that. Yes, misleading and deceptive conduct can definitely operate in this context. Mm. Um, misleading and deceptive conduct can operate even where there is a valid and existing contract. The other thing is that uh, the way that you phrase that, then Carl gives rise to a distinction which has to be remembered that there is a difference between defective works as opposed to non-conforming works so when i say non-conforming they don't conform with the plans and specifications right so they're, they're they're separate things so if it's not rendered properly that's a defect if they didn't follow the plan and specifications that's non-conforming products if the, the homeowner just doesn't like just doesn't like the look of it now. They thought it was going to look different. Mm. Sorry, they thought it was going to look better or different than what it does. Yeah. But the builder has followed the plans and specs. Then there's a there's an element of caveat emptor, which means buyer beware. So what do you reckon? So in those circumstances where you know the, the the owner is not you know savvy in the construction space or in the building space, doesn't know what it's going to look like or turn out to, should they sort of engage an independent you know? professional to sort of advise on whether this is suitable for their needs or it's been sort of translated into more layman terms? Yeah, I mean, in, in the course of getting the house inspected, you can say to the building inspector, this is part of what is in the plan and specs. They haven't built it yet. Can you tell me what it looks like? And then the, bu the building inspector may have photos of other jobs he's taken mm. where he says, well, this is what it looks like um, from other jobs I've done. But even more importantly than that, ask the builder what it's going to look like. Ask the builder to say, show me photos of how it's going to look. Mm. If, if the builder shows him photos of how it's going to look and it looks like that, and then all of a sudden three years, uh, sorry, six months down the track, the, build, the owner says, that doesn't look how I wanted it to. Well, it might be bad luck, mm. depending on the circumstances. If yeah. he was shown photos and he said, yeah, that's fine, go ahead. And, and it looks like the photos, but the, the owner is still not happy, then, you know, sometimes you can't satisfy all owners. Yeah, no, that's a fair call. But I think it sort of goes to, you know, it speaks to the, the importance of doing your diligence and making sure that you really understand what the specification is. And if you do have any questions, right. come up front. And not making, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, and not making assumptions about something. Yeah, 100% not making the assumptions yeah. either, just asking the questions and getting yeah. stuff right in if you can. Yeah. So that'll, that'll be your best. Um, like, like a lot of things in life, there are no silly questions. Well, I suppose there are, but sometimes it's the silly question that you don't ask is the one that comes back to bite you later on. 100%. Yeah. Uh, I'll move to the Q&A. We've got, we've got a few questions, but I think all have been answered except for two. So, Paul, we'll start off. And these are all in the building contracts um, part of the seminar. Um, one person's been asked, one person's asked a question around sort of dispute resolution. They've got a dispute they want to sort of take up to the next stage. Um, you know, they, you know, I think you mentioned that sort of lawyers are just that they don't, they don't encourage lawyers to sort of get involved. Um, in the DRB, DRB, yeah. Yeah. Well, this person's asking more around the role of the VBA, um, the Victorian Building Authority, and how okay. they can sort of assist. Is there much of a difference, Paul, in your experience, what they do, or is it best to go to DBDRB or? Um, generally speaking, the VBA does not get involved in individual cases. 
Right. They will sometimes if it if it indicates some systemic issue, um, or if you know the builder has is repeatedly having issues on different jobs and they're keeping on getting reported to the VBA. The VBA has a disciplinary function, and it well the VBA is quite very roughly equivalent to the ACCC in the consumer context. Um, they, they they don't enforce the law um, so much. Um, in individual cases, I, I don't, a lot of the time the owner will come to me and say, I've got this building defects and I've been trying to resolve it and I've done this and I've done that and I've reported it to the VBA and I'll say, well, what happened to the VBA? Um, and they said, oh, they got a letter, we've got a letter back from them saying they can't assist. So show me the letter. And the way that they look, sometimes I wonder whether they're standard letters that the VBA writes when certain issues are brought up to them, they just write back and say this. So yeah. it's it's not really the type of body to resolve an issue on a job between an owner and a builder. They're a, regu yeah. they're a regulator more than a dispute resolution. Dispute resolution body. Body. Yeah, all right. So over that answer that first question. And that takes us to the last question for today, which is around, again, the building contracts and the, and the topic that you mentioned, uh, call around variations. Um, you know, our forthcoming our builders usually with variations because this individual is asking, well, they haven't been sort of told of any variations, but now starting to see differences in the specification when they've gone around doing building inspections. You talked about non-conforming matters and you talked about building defects. Would this sort of fall into the non-conforming category where they see that things have changed? Um, it might be there might be a valid reason behind it, but the builder might not have communicated it proactively to the owner. What should the owner be doing? Should they be sort of raising that as non-conforming? Is that where the first port of call should be? It would be because yeah. because the works are not in conforming or not in accordance with the plans and specs, then it's a non-conforming product. Um, if they if if it, if it was to be changed, it should have been subject to a variation. It's as simple as that. It should have been documented, and that. that Every now and then builders don't communicate as they should. Every now and then owners don't as well, 100%. I'm not saying either one, either party is more at fault. Yeah. But that seems like a situation where it's very tempting, I guess, where the builder is under some tight, tight financial and time um, deadlines where they have an issue and they, they want something to be changed, but they think, well, I can't really wait for the owner to respond. They might, they might be overseas or whatever. I'll just get on with it and I'll just make the change. Uh, nobody will notice. Mm. And we'll just get on with it and do it. Where it's, you know, it's a potentially it's a breach of the contract because the plans and specifications are generally um, a part of and or attached to the contract. So if you change the plans and specifications, you're potentially changing the contract unilaterally without the other party's consent. So it's potentially a breach of contract. Yeah. So I think it's quite important that if you do find that there's anything that's not sort of you know, in line with the plan or specification that you raise it, don't just skip it, you know. That's right. I mean, the nature of a build as well is that if you if you notice an issue, say, behind a wall, if you don't say anything, then once the wall gets built, it's going to be a lot harder to deal with because then you're going to, if you're going to get a building inspector to look at the at the thing that was changed and it's behind the wall, yeah. the only alternative the build the inspector might have is to to knock the wall down to look at it, to look at it. Yeah. And then the builder says, "Well, I'm not going to pay you for that. Why should I pay for you knocking the wall down and reconstructing it? Um, it's going to build. It's going to blow out the build time, and I'm not paying for it. Mm. So if you've got the issue, you've got to deal with it then, and not leave it leave it till later. And then I'm I'm sure um, there's other examples where uh, I, I don't know what the word is, but it could be cumulative that you know that, um, certain um, things in a build are cumulative upon the other. You do this, and then you do that, and then you do that." And you almost can't backtrack sometimes. Yeah, no, it can all add up if you don't do it um, at the start. Yeah, or and, and and so that if if something proceeds on further into the build, you can't then fix the old issue. Yeah, I mean insulation yeah. might be another example. Say there's insulation yeah. in the walls, you can't view insulation by unless you drill a hole or climb in through, through yeah. the roof or you know knock the wall down. Yeah. 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 No, some invasive. Um, or yeah, destructive technical. testing, it's called, and then the issue comes who pays for it. Yeah. But if it does turn out to be that um, even after all of that call, 
you know, that person didn't come, the bill didn't comply with the plan or use the wrong insulation or whatever it might be, then there'll be more merit on that for the, for the owner to claim it back from the builder, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, well, that's, that brings us to the end, I think, of today's uh, session on, which started off with business practices followed by building contracts. Uh, thank you, Paul, again, for your time. His details are on screen. He's the principal lawyer at Law and Lydiard and um, practices across these key areas. So if you do have any specific questions that you want to ask him or engage in legal advice, uh, please do so. That brings us to the end of the session. Uh, so, as I mentioned, today's session has been recorded, uh, is being recorded, sorry, and following the session's um, completion, we'll upload this straight to YouTube so you can watch it again or forward it to your friends and family for their, um, their viewing. There'll also be a one-page handout which will be sent out by me um, to you as registered participants by email, uh, which contains the one-page handouts um, for both seminars. Uh, just a reminder that, uh, you know, if you do, um, if you have enjoyed today's session, uh, please do follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, and please do share, um, be informed with your friends and family. We do rely on word of mouth, um, as that's the best form of, um, you know, uh, advertising, we believe. If you've enjoyed it, I'm hoping others will also enjoy it too. Our next session is on the 20th of June, that's Tuesday. It will be covering planning for retirement. Uh, so Estelle Kelly of Desire to Retire will be uh, presenting um, an informative session, a seminar on um, how to prepare to plan for retirement. That brings us to the formal um, closure of today's session. Again, Paul, thank you very much for your time. You. No worries at all. And um, we look forward to seeing you all again at our next Be Informed session. Bye for now. Thank you. See you, Paul. See ya.